So thanks so much for yeah. agreeing to chat to us. Um, we've known each other for a while now and had a few sort of background conversations. And um, while traveling recently on a research trip and informally over coffee and dinner occasionally. Um, and it's really nice of you to have take this time to meet in your office. Thank you. Um, it's very nice to, to have you. To chat about um, what is important to you. Um, so I'd like to start with a question that really sort of tries to go to the root cause of your sort of motivations and thinking around the issue of epistemic injustice. What was it that drew you to that? I'm extremely interested in feminism anyway and the way that uh, feminists have helped us uh, see inequality in very innovative ways. And there was, I was reading uh, the Stanford Philosophical Encyclopedia one time and I came across a reference by Miranda Fricker in which it said that women's ways of knowing and experiencing the world have been dismissed. And I find that really, really intriguing because I was teaching, <laughs> I was teaching Bourdieu at the time and the reproduction of inequality. And I was just startled by this. So I began to read Miranda Fricker and other feminist epistemologists. And I realized that uh, this way of seeing injustice is quite new. In that, um, I don't think we have often given enough credence to the way in which people's testimonies or the things that they say are either granted credibility or denigrated or ignored or dismissed or downplayed on account of their status as a woman, their accent, the way they dress. So their status as a knower of their own experience is either given too much credibility excess because they come from the red class, they wear the red clothes, they have the red education, or all, all what we call deficits on account of the fact that they're the wrong sex, they're the wrong colour, their accent doesn't fit and they don't wear the red clothes. So that began my quest uh, and interest in uh, particularly feminist epistemology. Okay. That moment of reading an encyclopedia. Yes, indeed. It's just really interesting. They have just a yeah. line. It was just a couple of lines, but I found it revelatory. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Was that because you had a sense that there was a gap? I and, definitely and some did. of the sort of um, people use the word tools that just like it, but it, with some of the um, theories and concepts that you were using to try to an analyze injustice. It wasn't there. Yeah. So a lot of the research, a lot of the literature that I had read on social justice or social injustice does not look at justice in, the way, in terms of the speech acts of people and, uh, what lie, and the ways in which we all talk about stereotypes and prejudices. And that's not new, but the way that um, preforms that uh, heuristics about who a person is already predetermines how we're going to receive them as people worthy of respect or dignity or people whose testimony of their lived experiences we can trust. So my next project was to look at, for example, how young autistic people, for example, are not granted credibility not, are, and not seen as sexual beings on account of what we perceive or believe a disabled person should do and be. And that even when they tell us, I'm sexual, I want to know, I want to have a partner, we dismiss that, we discount that because we know better uh, and because we judge that they can't possibly know what it is that they want. Because being disabled, somehow they don't have the same levels of rationality or understanding that normal bodied or able bodied people do. So there's definitely a gap. But it's a, it's a field of growing interest, yeah, that sort of feminist epistemology and using epistemology to understand issues of social injustice yeah. and inequality, of course. Um, the question I'm going to ask now, in a sense, is, is sort of related. I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, ah, okay. Um, why do you think this is an important issue for education or higher education at this time now? Well, um, I won't speak so much about any 
quality, or it won't seem like an adjust, a condition of inequality at the moment, but it also ties into epistemologies of ignorance and the ways in which we are kept ignorant of certain forms of knowledge, certain practices, and so on and so forth. So, again, some research that I've done with a colleague is how, for example, we're all immersed in the internet. And I think we're only now begin, beginning to realise what has actually happened when we go into the, onto the internet and how avatars are created of us, to which we are ignorant, about which we are ignorant, and access to which we, at the moment, do not have any rights. Um, so ignorance about what happens to the data about us when we go online actually is a, is a very, very powerful means of, one, learning about us, having information over which we have no control, no access to, so that the platforms that collect the data about us can do what they wish with that data. And these are, and, and also that these are forms of, I don't know if it's deliberate ignorance, but there are certain forms of cultivated ignorance, willed ignorance, vested ignorance, and so on and so forth. So that, again, depending on who you are, if you're a woman of colour, for example, you might find that when you go onto an online site and type in the word black woman, as a well-known researcher did in the United States in 2012, what did Google, the Google engine throw up? Pornographic images of black women. So the black women are racialized, they're pornographied, and very many black women, of course, because of the status that they have in American society, found that they were powerless to do anything about that. So you have forms of cultivated ignorance married to forms of epistemic injustice. So it's two very powerful ways of looking at how, um, how we're kept in ignorance yeah. and how we're denied status and how, in many respects, we're denied equality on the internet. Now, what does that mean for higher education? Well, do students actually know what they're doing when they're looking for information for assignments? at a postgraduate level or an undergraduate level when they go and do Google searches rather than say use the library searches for information. How do they know which sources to trust? What judgments and evaluations do they make when they decide that this is trustworthy, this is authentic, this is reliable, so on and so forth? What criteria are they using? So I think that at that particular level, epistemic injustice and epistemologies of ignorance can help us understand the kinds of practices that we use in higher education to educate ourselves. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what gaps do you think, so you've, you've mentioned um, some of these now, mm -hmm. but in terms of, of researching for those who might be listening, there might be people who are listening who are researchers in higher education or in um, critical education studies, or those who are in the practice of educational institutions, um, what gaps do you think there are that really are glaring and, and there's space for people to, to look at and explore and try to address? Well, one, for example, is the notion of voice. What does it mean for a student to have a voice in a higher education setting, and particularly international students? What kind of... Uh, stereotypical constructions are made by the international student depending on what part of the world that student comes from and how do these stereotypical constructions feed into prejudice that inform teaching practice for example that therefore inform how the student sees him or herself in relation to how other students in relation to the institution and indeed to those who teach her. So I think that there's a huge literature on voice, I know that, and mm. on critical pedagogy. But critical pedagogy can't quite do, I don't think, what epistemology or epistemic injustice can do, which is what is the content of the voice, from whom is the voice emerging, and uh, what are the constructions behind the voice. So it's not enough to raise consciousness as critical pedagogists would argue, it's not enough. Because if you're not aware of the heuristic devices that you're using to construct the person whose voice you're trying to help, what you might be doing is actually perpetuating inequalities in very subtle but very definite ways. 
Mm. So that's one gap that I think needs mm. to be addressed. And you've really touched on the idea of a sense of, of self-criticality and mm. and awareness really of, in a sense, um, how we might become mechanisms of those very things we're trying to correct. Absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely right. Which I guess is where another area of interest would be in terms of epistemic ignorance mm -hmm. and um, and those of us who are in a position to teach and lead and, and educate. Indeed. Yeah. I mean to take a very simple example, the, stereo the stereotype is that the, that the Southeast Asian student is very hard working, um, very hard working, submissive, passive receivers of knowledge. Um, but what happens when we confront a student who doesn't conform to that stereotype? I mean, yeah, it seems a benign stereotype, doesn't it? But it, but the question then to ask is, but what if the student doesn't conform? And to our expectations of what that student does, does that in any way impact on the way in which we interact with that student? Or what we think that student is capable of doing or realising or achieving? And I'm not sure that we pay cognizance to, to, to that at all or indeed to the idea that even seemingly benign stereotypes or positive stereotypes have a dark underside. Mm. We don't address it, mm. you know? Seen as harmless, yeah. but they're not. I mean, um, well, I think what's interesting is there's more and more um, literature growing as, um, as I'm thinking particularly, you were talking about international staff, uh, students, and I'm thinking about international staff. So a point where voice is in a, a point where you can actually articulate it yes. because you're given legitimacy as a staff member yes. around how those stereotypes play up against the figures of authority you can Indeed. occupy in yes. university spaces. Yes. So um, because that's a, again that's a, a concept that is very relevant to epistemic injustice is the effect of identity power, and that students are always coming up, of course, against identity power in the institution and again identity power and aligning with the sources of identity power that grant credibility that allow you to believe that you can trust because you're relying on reputation the reputation of queens the reputation of that particular um, lecturer for example and of course we have to rely on our reputation as one of the ways means by which we come to a judgment about what we can trust and you know, what we judge to be authentic. But I'm not sure that as educators in higher education institutions that we do actually engage the students in ways that allow them to critically think about the people in authority that are educating us. You know, why do we trust Queen's? Why, you know, I, I, I think Queen's is a great place to come to. Don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm not suggesting that. Uh, but it is, but it's the, but it, it's, it's about identity power and what identity power means and why we either oppose forms of identity power or align ourselves with identity power that has the power to say this is good, this isn't, trust this one, trust that, and so on. Well, I think as um, sort of neoliberal pushes are happening, that's happening not just in terms of students and staff of the academic versus the student who's a sort of a, no, a novice knower trying to reach some sort of sense of hierarchy. Yes. There's also a recognition that it's happening um, between universities yes. in a way that it has always exist, existed but is, is um, really out of control at the moment with uh, university rankings, massive um, global pushes towards yeah. um, homogenizing university spaces. Yeah. Um, and of course, the authority of the Western University. Yes. This is other notions of knowledge. Yes. That have exactly. always existed. Yeah. So, what forms of knowledge do we appreciate and why? And again, that's part of epistemology of justice: is why do we grant credibility to certain forms of knowledge whilst disparaging or ignoring or trying to sideline other forms of knowledge that we no longer regard as valuable for whatever reason? Yeah. And there are very, very powerful discourses around forms of knowledge, disciplines of knowledge, that I don't think that we're interrogating enough. Mm. So I think that we could invite students to engage in those kinds of questions 
about what's happening in higher education. Yeah, and is higher education the good that we've been brought up? Well, I suppose as a in the liberal tradition, in the, you know, in the traditional liberal tradition of education as an intrinsic good. Well, is it an intrinsic good anymore? Are there only some forms of knowledge of intrinsic value, whereas other forms of knowledge are losing their value as something of intrinsic worth? Say philosophy, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm. I would say that students and staff should be engaging with oh, totally ideas. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Okay, so um, part of the reason why I'm putting together these interviews, or not just for the courses that I teach in, or perhaps that you teach in, or, is also for um, colleagues or interested um, researchers in, in other parts of the world who won't get to meet us in, in the flesh, or hopefully will at some point, but can listen to this and, and it might strike a chord or they might, might want to make connections. Mm -hmm. um, where do you see your, your, yourself going in terms of the work that you do and how you'd like to connect if there are people listening um, who then might want to make contact with you? Well, I, I mean, I suppose um, in the West, particularly as a feminist, um, there's a huge amount of research done on, on feminist positions in the West, and it would be lovely to be able to connect with feminists in other parts of the world to find out what's going there. And whether, I mean, I think the beauty of uh, the concepts that I use and the constructions that I use, they're very general, they're abstract, so that you can fill them with the content from your own particular context, experience, and, and, and Position. So I think that if colleagues in other parts of the world were interested in at least talking and exploring how some of the sort of philosophical perspectives that I'm interested in could be of help to them and thinking about what's going on in their particular environments, then that I would love to hear from them. Lovely. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. You're very it's really welcome. nice to be in your office and to chat with you. And with you too. And let's continue this conversation another time. You always will. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay.